Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to our talk this afternoon, uh, which is all about Nidaria and um, the family that includes anemones, corals, and jellyfish. Uh, now, my name's Matt, and I work at Cornwall Wildlife Trust as the Marine Awareness Officer. And um, well, this this talk, I'm hoping you're going to find interesting, and and uh, will hopefully inspire you to want to learn more. It's by no means um, an introduction, it's no means exhaustive. I'm not going to be able to cover every species in, in a short talk, but it, but it is an introduction to the common species you can find on the shore when you're out doing a shore search survey, for example, um, or doing shallow uh, coastal dives um, with the sea search project. So we are uh, really lucky in Cornwall that when we go out diving, um, we come across such a variety of different nidarians and you know there might be beautiful coral reefs in hot countries but our rocky reefs covered in a wall of mouths as you can see in this lovely picture by Anita Sherwood it's really a stunning uh, sight and you know, literally every little every square inch of that rocky reef there is covered in, um, in creatures we're all trying to catch plankton our seas are so rich in plankton around the UK we have this great diversity and um, yeah, really Im Im impressive group of organisms, the Nidarians. So um, if you want a good resource to go to, to learn about really, the anemones and the corals, um, this is the book that I, I sort of really swear by, by Chris Wood. He's the chap who set up Sea Search and has uh, done a really great job on this, this one. They've just launched the second edition. So please go and uh, get a copy from the Marine Conservation Society website or Next time we get let out, if you come along on one of my events, I've got lots of copies of all these books for sale. So what is a nidarian? Uh, well, nidarians are stinging animals. So the name nidaria comes from the Greek nidos, which means nettle. And uh, they're all capable of stinging. Although um, in the UK we're quite lucky that none of our nidarians give a really severe sting. Uh, and that's probably because um, although they're trying their best to kill us, our skin is too thick for most of them to get through with their, their poisonous uh, equipment I'm going to be talking about in a minute. So uh, within the Nidarians, this big phylum of, of uh, marine animals, we've got three large groups. We've got a few other small groups like the box jellyfish, but because they're not cornish, we're not going to talk about them today. Sorry, Mateus, I know you're a big fan of those. They're pretty dangerous, aren't they, box jellyfish? But they're only in hot countries like Australia. So but today we're going to because I'm going to run out of time, we're really focusing today on anemones and corals and a few hydras. So what they are, they're radially symmetrical. And what that means is if you take one of these animals, you could cut it in half and both halves would be the same. If you're looking down on the top of the anemone in that picture, you can see a slice, someone's taking a, a slice of cake almost out of that, and you could take multiple slices and they'd all be the same. So basically the animal is radially symmetrical. And what it has, it has a body cavity with a hole, uh, which is the mouth. When they eat food, food gets passed down into the mouth by the tentacles and then digests the food. Um, but it's a one-way street, so any waste comes back out of the mouth. So in effect, their mouth um, is also their bottom. Uh, around the mouth, they have this ring of tentacles with stinging cells. And you can get free swimming variants or medusa, or attached. And nidarians, which we call polyps. They can live on their own and they can live in colonies. So I'm going to show you some. Uh, this is a classic drawing out of um, um, barns in vertebrate zoology. If you haven't got a copy of that, that is, you really want to get into the invertebrates, that is the Bible. And anyway, it shows you that they are essentially exactly the same. The one on the left is uh, the, the polypoids phase, that's sort of a typical anemone looking creature, isn't it? You see it's stuck by its base to the seabed. But the other one is free swimming and it is essentially exactly the same. It's just just free swimming, it's kind of effectively upside down and um, but you can see all of the layers of tissue are all exactly the same. They're three simple layers of tissue um, in their body and one mouth and one sort of gut. Now the way they sting and is pretty amazing. So as the title of the talk suggests, it's all I'm going to be talking a little bit now about how they how this works. Now what they have in their epidermis, the outer layer of skin, are loads of these tiny little cells called nematocysts. 
and a mattacist is a really interesting apparatus. Um, it's driven by water pressure. If you imagine a, a water balloon, you push your finger into it, your finger wants to spring back out. Now these um, um, defensive or attacking um, cells are uh, very similar. Water pressure wants to fire them open, um, but they're held locked and armed and ready for use. As soon as something touches the trigger, it will burst open and water pressure fills up the, uh, these sharp threads and spines and uh, turns the whole sort of cell inside out, as we can see in that scary looking drawing. And this is going on on a microscopic le level whenever anything touches the tentacles of the anemone. Now uh, on YouTube there's some great videos. Uh, this one um, was done in Australia at um, uh, the University up in Queensland. And this is a Irukandji jellyfish, a very dangerous jellyfish. And this, this, I can't actually get the video to play, but I've taken stills of it and it shows you before and after. So that is almost an instant effect as thousands of these nematocysts fire. You can see the, you know, the long thin um, tentacles that come out. There are lots of sharp spines there as well that you can't see. So some of the uh, nematocysts are sticky and some of them um, will penetrate and inject venom. And this is what all nematocysts, oh, oh, sorry, all uh, the darians are doing uh, when, when we touch them. There's also some other interesting things about the darians. When you shine light on the darians, they can look very different. So this is a uh, little a scene from a local uh, dive site near me of Holywell Bay. These are big, big um, mussels covered in jeweled anemones and the one on the left was just under natural light. It looked really kind of green and quite, quite pretty, sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, quite coral, um, coral light, this sort of iridescent greeny colour. But as soon as I put a flash on there, you can see uh, the picture on the right, very different. And um, corals and anemones, have got quite interesting pigments within their tissues. If you shine blue light onto anemones, this is a, um, a gem anemone, lovely photo by Alex Tatterstall. Uh, you can see actually the colours that reflect back at you are very different. So blue light or UV light um, causes them to, uh, to um, fluoresce back um, strange colours. And why they do that is, is a bit of a mystery. This is um, one by Adele, which is a Snake looks common snake look anemone under some UV light. Um, the, the pigments within their tissues we think play a role in protection from UV radiation. So maybe maybe that's what why they're there. Um, but possibly there are other other um, reasons as to why they go to the rest. So the, the phylum is uh, like I said, can be broken into three main groups: the, the jellyfish, the anemones and corals, and the hydroids. I haven't got time today to go into the jellyfish, sorry about that. So I'm going to start off with the anthozoa, the anemones and the corals, and uh, we're going to look at hard corals. Now ecologically these are the ones that are really important in the tropics forming coral reefs. In the UK less so arguably, uh, except for the deep sea corals, the things like the philia. Um, in our shallow seas we don't really have many hard corals. Something that most of these tropical hard corals have Quite interesting actually have a symbiotic relationship with tiny algae called dinoflagellates which live within the tissues of the coral within the um, um, and within the epidermis and what they're doing is they're actually taking sunlight uh, so that they can then photosynthesize and they can then reproduce themselves but excess energy that they create is then shared with the coral so effectively they're like lodgers that pay rent to, to their landlord the coral and when we're talking about corals and anemones, etc., the polyp is the smallest whole living unit. So um, in a big, a big um, tropical coral, you have thousands of tiny little polyps all fused together. Um, but that's what I mean when I say polyp. It's the smallest living, whole living unit of the Nidaria. And here's a diagram of a hard coral polyp. And you can see um, the dark sort of stuff at the bottom, this is the skeleton, so hard corals lay down a calcareous, calcium carbonate skeleton uh, and that creates a little cup that they can uh, retract into if they want to. The soft part of the, the coral polyp the, is kind of um, water filled and can expand and contract so they can easily sort of hide away if they have to for protection. And hard corals can reproduce in two different ways. They can um, 
they can actually uh, split so they can um, do what they call intratentacular budding or longitudinal fission where they, they split in half or they can um, bud off from the base which is what they call extratentacular budding. Um, anemones can do the same thing, they can split in half um, or they can split off at the base, we call that basal lateration and some anemones actually produce little tiny baby anemones that just pop out from the mouth so they're, they're viviparous which is quite interesting. Anyway, back to the hard corals. In Cornwall, the most common one we find is this. It's absolutely beautiful. It comes in loads of different colour varieties, but its size isn't all that impressive. But then size is not the thing, is it? And I think uh, there's so much impressive wildlife in our waters. Um, when you get close to these, they're really stunning. This shows you one up on the shore. So when they're out of water, you can see that one's retracted right down into the coral cup. So it's uh, not going to be available for any predators that might want to eat it. And here's one fully expanded, lovely photo by a dear friend of the trust, Tony Sutton, really accomplished photographer. And uh, beautiful Sutton markings on the paper. And another very closely related one is the Southern Cup Coral, and it is quite hard to tell them apart. It has more of a, um, a spherical outline, uh, maybe a bit smaller. A species that we see them around on the shore. Quite, uh, quite frequently actually in Cornwall, but very rare nationally, the scarlet and gold cut coral. And this is a lovely photo taken in a rock pool just near Neepy by uh, Tom de Gerg, a friend of ours. A uh, lovely uh, little um, bright yellow cut corals, about the size of a smarty, and uh, they love surging habitats, so really um, you know, shallow gullies on the north coast of Grain. We've got a few places on the south coast as well where you find them. And this is a famous site um, in UK called the Cave of Dreams, where you have to hold over in the morning or something. And the, the name was given to them after a lot of enthusiastic sort of uh, responses that day. Now, the largest of this group, the largest star coral we get in the UK, is this one, the Sunset Cup Coral. And you can find this in Cornish waters uh, around the, the Tamar, the entrance to Plymouth Sound. And on, uh, well, you can't really call it silly Cornwall, but on the Isles of Scilly, they find them. Somewhere in Cornwall, uh, the rest of Cornwall, we're going to find these one day, and we're always searching for them. So they look a lot like the scarlet and gold cut coral, but that one's only, like I said, about the size of a smarty. This one could be much bigger, up to, you know, an inch or two inches even across. The, uh, they're solitary hard corals. So unlike the, the hard corals on the tropics that form big reefs, these live sort of individually um, on, attached to rocky reefs um, in quite sort of sheltered places apparently with um, often vertical walls and everything. I'd love to see one of those. So moving on now to uh, another group, the Order Acton area. These are the sea anemones. And it's a large group, so we'll spend a bit of time on this one. And hopefully you're going to see some um, that are familiar to you now in the next slides. This one, probably the most familiar, the beadlet anemone. It's called a beadlet anemone uh, for two reasons, I suppose. Firstly, because when they when the tides out and they close up, they do look a bit like a little sort of shiny bead. Don't uh, be tempted to poke them like we used to do when we were kids, because they've only got a limited amount of moisture trapped inside there. And, when you poke them, they, they, they lose that moisture, which is what they need to survive whilst the tides out. But um, another reason they're called beadlet anemones is you can see these tiny little blue spots all around the, um, the top of the anemone there, the ball, at the base of the tentacles, and these are called acroridgii. They're a type of modified tentacle. They're packed full of extra strong nematocysts, and those are quite interesting. They use those for defence, but also in competition with other anemones. So, you know, you see them sat on the rock there, they're not really doing much. You kind of think they're probably quite a boring creature that doesn't really move, but in actual fact, they do. They move around, they can shuffle along on the rocks. Um, when they need to move fast, the anemones will sometimes actually completely let go there with their um, hold fast at the base and sort of drift in the current and then reattach. Some, some anemones will cartwheel, in the tropics, there's a species of anemone called the swimming anemone, uh, which will actually let go completely 
and in the mid water it will bend the column from side to side and uh, it's probably not the best swimmer but it, it, is, it is able to move around amazing underwater so when they're open when the tide comes in they're beautiful the tentacles again are captured in the mastocysts they look like lovely flowers but they're they're just waiting to sting and kill their prey and uh, they are also aggressive and this is a photo a still taken from a video i found on youtube showing those acroridgii really stretching out and being used to sting their neighbors and when i was at university a friend of mine set up a little aquarium and put in there lots of um, beavers and anemones and studied their behavior and really found that they prefer certain areas in the aquarium and they'll fight for that that space which is quite incredible so closely related is the strawberry anemone grows a bit bigger and has these lovely markings very common species in cornwall but not that common elsewhere in the uk and a lovely photo there of one fully expanded another one by tom from hydromotion media okay the next one a very common species again and this is a species that has very sticky tentacles so i think you know when you touch an anemone in fact you have to be quite careful with anemones the tips of your fingers the skin is really thick isn't it but when you're in and rock falling you've got to be careful that the anemones don't sort of touch you on any other parts of your body where your skin's thinner if you get get a you know just light contact with a snake locks anemone on the forearms there you get a really nasty sting like a metal uh, so this is the the beige or sort of more brownie cut version color version of the snake locks anemone they grow quite big and there's several color varieties another one is the the green which often has these beautiful iridescent pink tips and this was photographed in the snake uh sorry the seagrass down at helford and I discovered to my uh, cost that they do really sting if they get you on your face. Because when you're swimming through the seagrass, as you do, looking for seahorses or other creatures, um, it's quite easy to get a really bad sting, as I, as I did once with uh, a lady that was just sort of sticking onto my face. And there you can see an amazing photo that when they're sort of closing up a little bit, all those um, all those pigments are really concentrated up in the tentacles and you get this amazing sort of uh, iridescence so a beautiful animal snake looks anemones um, unlike the uh, beadlet and the strawberry that i already showed you snake looks anemones don't fully retract all of their tentacles i've seen them partially retracting but never seen them um, closed up so much that you can't see the tentacles so that's one way that helps you identify them i'm sure what you'll often find is there'll be a little piece of rock wall where the habitat is clearly good and these by budding and splitting in half um, they'll clone themselves and you end up with a large population of the same color variety in one little patch this is a very unusual color variety of snake locks and emony found down on prisk cove at the helford now i'm not i'm not sure actually if anyone else has if any if any academics have ever sort of studied this one um i can't i've shown it to quite a few experts and they'll say it's definitely a snake looks but it's such an unusual color variety it did make us wonder maybe it's a new species and um you saw my talk i expect about cornish crustaceans last week well i already mentioned the nemo of, of cornwall this is the little um leeches spider crab loves to hide inside the snake looks and emily it's a nice safe place for it to live because those tentacles are pretty pretty potent and sometimes snake looks and emonies will eat random things here's one that's just grabbed a moon jellyfish so they're opportunistic they um they get the majority of, of their uh nutrition from the zoanthale so remember i said car corals that have these tiny zoanthale within them snake looks have that too um but they also will catch and eat passing prey okay can everyone, can everyone hear me okay i just got something that said my internet wasn't working is it is it sounding okay Jax? you froze but yeah you're back i'm back oh good <laughs> sorry about that um right so this is uh this is another beautiful species quite common once you get your eye in for these but it was a species that i must admit i've, I've only really noticed a lot since i've started doing shore search surveys they tend to be in shallow pools where there's a covering of sand on top of rock 
And um, the reason for that is they really like this habitat. They stick onto the rock beneath the sand, and then if they need to, they can pull themselves down and sort of dive or hide their body in amongst the sand and the, and the gravel. It's called the daisy anemone. Goodness knows why it got that name, because it doesn't look anything like a daisy. It reminds me a lot of a sort of shag pile carpet, a bit like the tropical carpet anemones that the, uh, the little um, clownfish love so much. Uh, but it's only small, about an inch or so across. Comes in a whole variety of different colours. This was my favourite, that was um, a pose, a lovely blue one we found. And this is a reddish one we found down at Helford. Okay, so moving on now to an, uh, an anemone which is also quite common but sometimes overlooked. It's quite small but very beautiful. And this is a gem anemone closed up. It almost looks as this radial symmetry and these little warts on the column. One of the features of anemones, when you if you ever find an anemone that you're not sure what it is, don't just take a photo of the tentacles. Try to get some photos of the column because the patterns of warts and or the lack or the absence of warts will help you identify them. And uh, in this case, the warts on the gem anemone, they're not very adhesive. Sometimes they have these little lumps that are really sticky on some species, but the gem anemone, not so much. It reminds me of a little sort of urchin test, you know, the empty shell of an urchin. And this is what it looked like when it opens up. That was a photo I took down uh, Marazion. Really beautiful uh, creatures, gem anemones, but not very large. So only two or three centimetres of book. Okay, moving on to a much bigger anemone and hugely variable in colour is the lovely dahlia anemone named after this flower. It has these big fat tentacles that are quite transparent and uh, very, very variable in colour. Often when they're closed up, they look quite different. I'll come on to that in a minute. But here's some that are open, beautiful markings. And there's one closed up. So they have lots of walls all over the column that are very adhesive and they'll, they'll have lots of shells or bits of gravel stuck to those so that when they retract, they're protected. It's almost like a, a skeleton in effect. This is a great uh, day rock pooling. Just before Christmas, I was down there on the helpers and I was very pleased to get a fish in my photo. He's obviously not that afraid of the, the stingy tentacles. And on the same day, we found this one as well. So, so many lovely colour varieties of dahlia anemones. And these ones can be big, up to sort of uh, 10 centimetres across. And in fact, if you keep one in a fish tank and feed it, a lot of them probably grow even bigger. But in the wild, it, yeah, normally about 10 centimetres. They tend to be found on places where there's a really good bit of current. So, I know quite a few dive sites where you come across dahlia anemones where there's sort of strong flow and uh, lots of little bits of gravel for them to, they seem to like that so, um, and to stick onto their column. Okay, um, uh, one that's quite obscure, not really found very often, I don't think in other parts of the UK, but quite, quite common on some shores in Cornwall. This is the red speckled anemone. We've seen these in Hannaford, we've seen them at uh, um, Helford, and uh, you can see why it's called that on the column. It has little, little um, warts with a reddy sort of coloration and um, yeah sort of very speckly tentacles as well and there's one that's sort of more exposed although in this photo you can't really see the warts so a species i need to look for some better photos of, I think. okay so now we're looking at sort of more subtitled species if you go down to uh, yacht marina and look over the pontines you're going to see lots of these big fluffy anemones and when you're out diving as well you quite often find these on wrecks and in harbours as well. Uh, they're really, they've got a really long, smooth column, really tiny, finely divided tentacles. And uh, the plumos anemone is named after this sort of feathery plumage almost uh, that the tentacles look like. Um, I used to keep these in the aquarium and they're, they're quite interesting. They spend sort of roughly 50% of their time contracted, completely flat looking you know, pretty unattractive. But then when they, uh, if you add some plankton to the water, they start to really stretch out. Okay, another species that's quite common around Cornwall, you may even find actually when you're rock pooling, we have found it in a few places, and this is the, uh, the sandled anemone, also known as the fried egg anemone. And then you can see why it's called the fried egg anemone. Um, but the way you identify this one is not by the colour. 
because there's a very similar one called the elegant anemone which also has this color variety so what you're actually looking at and you can hopefully just about see it there's a couple of closed up ones in this picture and they have little tiny uh, stripes longitudinal pale stripes and a smooth column and that's how you can identify the sandaled anemone not really sure what sandaled refers to maybe it refers to those stripes Okay, so the one that it's easy to confuse with though is this one. And this was actually uh, photographed on the shore down at uh, Cape Cornwall on our radical rock pool last summer where we went in that massive rock pool. Remember that? Some of you, some of you were there, some of you missed it, sorry. <laughs> it was an awesome place. And uh, yeah, this one here, elegant anemone, much more commonly seen out on um, when you're diving, a lot deeper. And, there's so many different colour varieties. If you have a look at the book that I mentioned earlier, there's a whole page on all the different colour varieties. What allows you to identify them? They have slightly more tentacles than the sandals anemone. And here's a great photo taken just a few days ago by Josh, the sh our shore search volunteer. He was down at, um, I think it was Fistral, wasn't it, Josh? Yeah. And uh, here's, you can see the column of this anemone has the warts, and that's the distinctive feature of the elegant anemone, the wart, warts on the tent on the col on the column. And obviously, when you take a lovely photo like that, um, you don't feel like annoying that animal, so you can see its column, but but if you want to identify it, you kind of have to sadly. And I'm sure I'm sure he'll give us quite another day. They'll open back up again. They'll just temporarily close up if you sort of uh, gently touch them and you can see the column as you can in that photo. So moving on to some quite interesting, uh, uh, well, some more interesting ones. This is a this is a, a large, very tough anemone that gets to see a lot more of the world than your standard anemones do. It's called the parasitic anemone. A rubbish name because this isn't actually a parasite. It has a commensal relationship with hermit crabs. So in this photo, I'm holding a whelk shell with a hermit crab inside. And on its back, you can see this large anemone with a very tough sort of leathery surface, which I guess means that if it's dragged around it, you know, that protects it from getting uh, damaged. And uh, yeah, they're most commonly found on whelk shells or hermit crab shells, but sometimes you can find them on the legs of, of uh, spider crab, which is a photo taken just off the um, And it's not a parasite, like I said, it doesn't actually, um, it doesn't actually harm its host, but presumably, actually, it's sort of an example of mutualism. So the, the hermit crab benefits because predators will get stung and chased away by the stinging tentacles of the anemone. Um, but also the anemone benefits because it gets dragged around and it's more likely to come across some food or it might even steal some of the food of the, uh, the crustacean. So Caliactis parasitica. And this one has an interesting lifestyle too. This is the folk anemone, which which gets carried around by a hermit crab called um, Pagurus prido, which is, um, you know, this hermit crab has decided not to bother with big heavy shells. The anemone, because it's basically water filled, is almost neutrally buoyant, so it must take a lot less energy to carry around an anemone. And as you grow, you don't have to look for new shells because the anemone just expands. You can see the tentacles in that photo are just underneath the, um, the body of the crab. So a good position really to catch little scraps of food. And the anemone also has this interesting um, ability to be able to squirt out these tiny tentacles called acontia. So within the gut of the anemone, there are all these filaments that are used for digesting food. And sometimes some um, corals and anemones will actually squirt those out of their mouth. But there's also corals and anemones which can squirt them out through the body through the sides of the anemone and that's what happens in the case of the cloak anemone if the hermit crab is scared it shakes its body around and out come loads of these tiny acontia and these are packed with nematocysts they're not as sophisticated as tentacles they just sort of come out like a like silly string squirting out and basically what happens is the anemone um, all the muscles contract and the, the water gets squirted out through the mouth and then these are constantly they get fired out through little holes in the walls of the anemone. So yeah, quite amazing. Some anemones um, don't have a sticky hold fast and in the case of the tube anemone it has a very long collar and it's kind of muscular 
and it can use that pollen like a worm does to dig down into a substrate. And this one is called tube anemone. You find a lot of these when you're out diving, in our estuaries particularly, in places like mole beds. And um, yeah, very beautiful. And if disturbed, they just disappear straight down into the substrate. Um, a little bit like a tube, like one of these worms, one of these tube worms. And some anemones live on other cnidarians. And this is a very rare species in the UK. This is the sea, pink sea fan anemone. And um, as the name suggests, only found living on pink sea fan. So it has a very limited habitat range. And uh, there are lots of pink sea fans around the call. We're very lucky to have them. Um, however, there are only a few, a handful of sites where you also find pink sea fan anemones. And one of them is the, uh, the reefs around the Manacles, where this was photographed last year. So, yeah, stunning. You can spot there's a needy brunk in that picture. Some of you might be able to spot it. I can see two actually. They're brilliantly camouflaged. You can see my cursor, look. I'm just pointing at a little needy brunk there and another one there. That was last week's talk. You can watch it back, by the way. Last week's talk by Heather was on the YouTube channel. So, yeah, very rare species. That one. So, now we're going to talk about another group within uh, the Anthozoans, which is kind of related to corals. It's called the older coral Morpharia. They resemble corals, but they don't have a hard skeleton. And these are commonly seen in people's fish tanks. There's a tropical species. They're called mushroom polyps, and uh, you often see them in you know, tropical marine tanks. But in the UK, we actually have some members of this family, which is quite interesting. Not many people realise this, but the dual anemones are actually coral morpharians. They're not true anemones, and they're not true corals. They're in fascinating little creatures, though. They, um, as you saw in that previous photo, can completely cover rock faces underwater. They're subtitle. You rarely get these in rock pools. Um, I've only seen them once in a rock pool and only very rare. Uh, absolutely beautiful. You find that one, um, you have lots of different colour varieties and because they clone themselves, and, you know, create um, exact replicas of themselves, you get a large area of a rock covered in one colour and then you get another large area covered in another colour. Uh, these guys are catching plankton to eat, unlike the tropical ones, which photosynthesize using zoanthellae. But yeah, really stunning creatures. And another group that's very common in coral uh, reef tanks are the zoanthids. And this is worth a mention because they've got some quite interesting biology. They're colonial animals. And um, again, you know, they, they, they bud, but they're fused together at the base, which is quite interesting. Um, generally, some of the storage is mostly used to go. One of the things that these guys can do, that not many people know about, is they can produce some really nasty toxins. In fact, the, um, the toxins from these are, are deadly to humans. Um, and people keeping these at home have to be really careful if they, if they um, take a big clump of these out and chop them up and try and propagate them like that. Um, they have to be very careful. They wash their hands and don't sort of absentmindedly rub their eye or something like that and end up getting a deadly dose of uh, palytoxin. Now, whether our UK um, zoanthids also have this toxin, I still haven't managed to, to find out, and I'd love it if, uh, if an expert could get back to me. Um, but we have two common species in Cornwall of this group of zoanthids. Um, ah, that's incorrectly labelled. <laughs> these are called, um, they're not called dual anemones at all. Um, so these are cluster anemones. Um, but the, uh, the scientific name is correct, luckily. And then we also have the ginger tinies, which are very, very small. And you, what you can't see is underneath the sort of dusty, sort of clarty stuff that's over this rock, they actually, have, they actually are fused together. Um, and they sort of have these stolons, which are like roots that join them together. OK, so now we're quickly going to talk about this other big subclass, the Alcyon area. And, uh, so it's quite an interesting family. They're, they're known as octocorals. Each, ten, each polyp has eight tentacles, and it includes the ones I already mentioned, the beautiful uh, pink sea fans, a type of gorgonian. Um, and uh, yeah, so what you have is a, um, a skeleton, which is sort of a flexible sort of, um, pro it's actually made of uh, the same sort of material as your fingernails, the skeleton, or the rod. 
and then you have lots of polyps and joints together around around uh, that skeleton. And the uh, pink sea fan also comes in white, you know, that's more rare. This is a lovely photo by George Gould, which Angie's dad, which shows you the, um, the little pink patches are pink sea fan anemones living on this white anemone. Uh, pink sea fans are nationally scarce, but are locally common in Cornwall and uh, protected species, protected uh, feature within many of our own MPAs. And the soft coral family, this is um, within the same the opto corals, but um, slightly different biology. The soft corals don't have that sort of skeleton. Um, we have several species. The dead man's finger, which is this one, which is a beautiful animal actually with a really pretty name. Um, they, the, the tentacles when they come out make them look lovely and fluffy. But what the, the lump on the bottom there with the tentacles retracted does look a bit more like a, like a dead finger, doesn't it? But um, yeah, really lovely, stunning creatures. When the tide starts flowing, they really open up. Closely related, we've got the red fingers as well. Again, very rare in the UK, quite common in Cornwall. Okay, so that, that's, um, that's pretty much it for the anthozoans. Now I'm just going to very quickly talk about one group within this family. So like I said, I haven't got time to go through all of our jellyfish, but because there's a lot of um, rock crawlers in the audience, I thought I'd quickly mention sport jellyfish. Because in Cornwall we have this, we have quite a few species and they are absolutely stunning. Now I have to admit, my previous sort of career working in the world of aquariums, we used to overlook these. They are tiny and they really don't stand out. You have to have really good eyesight and lots of patience to see these. Um, but yeah, stork jellyfish, absolutely stunningly beautiful. They're really um, much loved by the Victorians. You can see lots of amazing sort of drawings that have done studies back then, but very little has really been done since on their biology. And there's still a lot of mysteries when it comes to stork jellyfish. So they are, as the name suggests, a jellyfish-like animal, but they have a stalk with an adhesive cup on the end that they use to stick onto seaweeds. They can grow, the largest ones we get are probably two or three centimetres long, so not very big, uh, usually smaller to be honest. And there are several species, so the first one there, this is the kaleidoscope stalk jellyfish, and the Halichlistus octoradiatus is the most common member of the Halichlistus family in Cornwall. And you can see the little white wall, all like structures in between all the tentacles. These are secondary anchors, and those are the diagnostic feature. So you can get a good enough photo to see if there's little round blobs in between the tentacles. That's how you know it's likely to be this species. There is another one called Halicletus auricula, which is also a protected species. Um, but it's quite hard to sort of tell the two apart. They're so similar. The octoradiatus has the sort of scattering of white blobs. You can just see my cursor just there. Those are the, those are the structures which are so you can tell it's that species. Okay, this one, Calvadosia campanulata, named after another flower. Uh, very beautiful when they open up. Often found on sea grass and other seaweeds, like um, this, this one's wireweed. They can vary a lot in colour, this one's much more red. And often you're looking more at the shape than the colour when it comes to stalk jellyfish. Okay, the next one, um, the Maltese cross jellyfish much more ornate and uh, you can see it's lovely oak what they call the oral surface at the top around the mouth is really big and flat and it has loads and loads of lovely sort of markings uh, Maltese cross stalk jellyfish and then the, the, the last one the sort of trumpet shaped stalk jellyfish called Cratolophus convolvulus it's um it's actually not a protected species unlike some of the others but quite common in Cornwall Particularly on, uh, around Poles F. So, nearly at the end, guys. I hope you're holding in there. I'm sorry. I could go on for a lot longer, but I'm sure you wouldn't appreciate it. And um, we're going to get on to some questions as well. If you've got questions, by the way, you can just use the um, chat feature at the bottom of your screen to just type in some questions. And that, you know, so as they come to you, write them down and we'll be going through them towards the end of the, the recording. So the hydrozoans is the last class I'm going to talk about. We don't have any fire corals that can give you a nasty sting in Cornwall, but in the tropics, watch out for them. This is one of the main reasons why 
dive instructors don't like people touching anything when they're diving. Fire corals are just one of many creeks that can give you a very nasty uh, sting. So anyway, the hydroids though um, that we do have in Cornwall are kind of coral-like creatures. Some of them are very tiny. This is a very common one called Thymonina pumilla, which you often find attached to seaweeds on the shore. Things like serrated rack, you get lots of these. And they look like little stacks of triangles. This is a good close-up shot that I took with my TG camera. Um, but yeah, they just look like hairs with the naked eye. Uh, if your eyesight's good enough, you might see the triangles. Here's another hydroid. This is one that lives exclusively on the back of hermit crab shells. Called hermit crab fur. You don't find it anywhere else, which I think is amazing. And it's another one that benefits and has a nice ride around the sea, seabed. And then we've got some beautiful, larger, fluffy hydroids. When you're out diving, you get lots of this stuff. This is Neptune beard. That's out of the uh, manacles. They're kind of six inches long from those strands. You get the, the, the wonderful Indian feather hydroid. And uh, that's very common in Tramble Bay and other areas of Cornwall. Gymnasium. And, there, and this one, the branch antennae hydroid. And there's loads and loads more species. They can be hard to identify without looking at them under the microscope. Um, so they tend to just get divers to write down fluffy hydroids if they can't identify them. Easily. And then finally, the last, uh, second to last one, this is a very weird animal found under a rock down on uh, the shore in Falmouth. And in fact, in Falmouth, this is where this species was first described by a, by a uh, Victorian doctor called William Pendleton Cox back in sort of 1920, I think it was, in 1910. And uh, this creature, when I first found one of these, I couldn't believe, I could, really couldn't tell what it was at all. But it is actually a hydroid. And what you have there is um, lots of creatures all stuck together, some of them forming a sticky mat that attaches it to the substrate. Some of them are, are feeding, and some of them are reproductive. And there's one closed up. And here's one stretched out. So a very strange creature. Its scientific name is Candelabrum octi, named after Dr. Cox. He, he discovered it. And uh, yeah, I think a very uh, fitting name for a quite a phallic looking creature. So the last one, and I said I wouldn't talk about jellyfish, but this isn't a jellyfish, luckily, is it? That is a you know, you, you all know that actually what you're looking at there is a colony of hydroids. So lots of these polyps will join together. One polyp forms a flotation service and becomes the float. It's completely fill, filled up with nitrogen gas. Several other polyps will be there for reproduction purposes. And the long, thin polyps that trail down it can be, you know, chains of polyps that can be sort of up to 20 metres long for feeding purposes and uh, yeah it, it makes the Portuguese man of war a pretty fascinating uh, fascinating little floating city almost so uh, and not a jellyfish and who knows we may get another big influx of these a couple of years ago we had a really exceptional year didn't we with large large numbers of these washing up in the land and in fact last winter there's uh, last autumn there's a few so it's normally autumn months when they turn up and normally we only get you know a few, few sightings maximum sort of a hundred in a year but um yeah, two two years ago we had thousands so clearly the conditions were great for these out in the open sea and then you get a lovely little uh, um Portuguese man wall looking just like a passenger there we'll up on the beach great place to find dogs so there you go folks uh thank you very much for listening i hope you all found that interesting it was uh, an introduction there's going to be lots lots more species you'll come across and if you're interested in helping us out with our recording of our local wildlife, you're you know, more than welcome to join in with any of our citizen science projects. And the two that I work on are sea search diving in Cornwall. And uh, if you're a qualified diver, up to you need to be qualified to um, be that sport diver or paddy rescue diver or equivalent with other agencies. And then you can come along and uh, we'll train you to record the wildlife and find. And anyone is welcome to join us rock pooling and you can find out a lot more about this on our website about both projects and on our facebook pages as well so please please check it out and um, get involved and uh yeah 
expand your knowledge. So there you go. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Hope you all found that interesting. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now, very quickly, is I'm just going to um, close this presentation and we're going to have a little look and just see what questions we've got coming up. So Josh, I don't know if you can see the chat there, can you? Um, yeah, I, I've got the first questions ready. Great. Okay, so what, what far away, Josh, what, what people are answering? Right, so we've had a couple of questions um, of the same sort of stuff. Um, which is, have you noticed any um, variation in Nidarian, so, as well as the jellyfish, um, changing with sort of global warming and species richness over the last few years? Oh, that, that's, that is a really great question. Um, there aren't any spe really specific examples of climate change indicators. So we've got lots of examples of climate change indicator species on the shore and in shallow seas. but. As far as I know, there aren't any um, really, really specific ones in the Darien family. We've got a few non-native species like the beautiful orange striped um, sea anemone that we're finding more and more frequently in harbours and marinas and Cornwall and estuaries. Um, but yeah, if anyone, um, if anyone knows of, of any climate change indicator species, please type it into the chat or unmute yourself and tell me at this point. But as far as I know, um, yeah, there was a chat theory, wasn't there, that the bow jellyfish they're becoming slightly more popular now because of the change in plankton um, that seems to be more abundant. Um, but I don't know how. Yeah, you get lots of variation in jellyfish, but yeah, I didn't really go into jellyfish did I in this presentation. But you know, the the changes in sort of jellyfish, uh, there's so many different factors that temperature and temperature is probably just one of them really. Um, there are other factors like that. Um, the amount of prey for the larvae jellyfish and the amount of plankton. Um, but yeah, it's possible that, that climate change is, is going to sort of affect that. But it's, that's a very sort of fluid thing, isn't it, jellyfish numbers? Um, but in terms of creep, like, um, yeah, other nidarians, I haven't got, I haven't got one for you. Um, and then Rebecca's asked, where did you go to university? Um, I went to Liverpool, University of Liverpool, and um, the reason I chose that place is because you have your final year on the Isle of Man in Port Erin Marine Laboratory and sadly that's been shut down but it was, the, it was one of the earliest uh, marine laboratories in Europe set up around the same time as the, the NBA and it was a real privilege to have been able to live on the Isle of Man for a year. Loved it. <laughs> um, so then Bees asked what camera do you use and what is your favourite and enemy species and why? <laughs> Well, most of the um, volunteers who, who come along on shore search um, these days are using these TG cameras. So they're made by Olympus. There's every year they bring out a slightly different one, but um, yeah, the Olympus TG2 I use. Um, and um, well, I've started using an Olympus TG4 recently, and yeah, they're all pretty much the same. They're great, great cameras. They they allow you to get really close to um, creatures underwater. So great, um, great for rock pulling. And um, what's my favourite? Oh, that is hard. That is, yeah. I don't know. I love them all. <laughs> Too many. I'll tell you later. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then Vicky's now asked, does the silly string get taken back in within the anemones? Um, yeah, does it get taken back in? I think it, yeah, so it, expel it. Those are contia that get fired out. They look like silly string that just fire up through the wall of the anemone. Yeah. So they... They're, they're capital in the matter says some anemones do it for feeding, so actually draw them back in with you know your kind of presumably tiny prey, plankton, etc., attached. So they can draw them back in, but they're also very, very breakable. So they presumably then expect it all to be um, drawn back in, and it, it doesn't really harm the anemone if it loses a few of those uh, kind of sacrificial. Um, some of the tropical anemones are amazing; they can uh, and corals. They produce these really long sweeper tentacles and you may have seen on some of the documentaries when one lump of coral is worried that another lump of coral is encroaching on its territory and often under the cover of darkness they'll send out these long tentacles with the current and they'll sting their neighbour and keep it at bay. So yeah, quite, quite amazing. Yeah, any more? And, yeah, there's a couple more. So Sue's asked, why is the stork jellyfish um, 
I can't say the Latin name, the one that isn't protected, not protected. Uh, because only uh, a compared small, to the other jellyfish that are. Yeah, only a small number of um, jellyfish species have been put on this sort of list of, um, that's been created by various sort of experts and government agencies. And um, yeah, there's quite a number of things that are rare but aren't on the protected list. And I suppose they have to sort of apply lots of different logic to it. And um, yeah, it, it, I mean, I suppose their, their aim is to protect as much as possible, well, protect a sort of a whole sort of swathe of species, but you can never protect everything. And um, they're, quite often their approach is, is more about protecting the habitat than individual species, but you know, um, in Cornwall, the Halicolistus and the Lucas scenariopsis species. Actually, that's been renamed. I should have changed the slide, but th those two, those two are protected, and all the other ones aren't, which seems a bit unfair. But that's just how it is. Okay, and then the last, oh, uh, yeah. So Paul has asked, can you tell us anything about their um, their reproduction? So I've yeah, Paula, yeah, good. I did sort of mention it very briefly, didn't I? But yeah, so anemones are incredible. So I'm going to focus mainly on anemones. They can, um, someone, someone asked how long do anemones live? And in Aquaria, they seem to live for ages. I, I ended up, when I worked at Niki, I was there for, running the aquarium at Niki for 12 years. And the anemones that are in cover of the tanks there were the same ones that I had when I first started. Because effectively they're immortal. Because by splitting in half, you're cloning yourself. and you know, if you die, well, you haven't really died because your clones still exist. It's a bit like Voldemort, isn't it? It's like Paul Cruxes. But the other thing, they, they, can, they can do that. They can split um, longitudinal fission to create clones. Uh, they can also break off a little bit on the base, which is called basal laceration, just leave a little, a little uh, skin tag, if you like, then grows into another anemone. So they, um, and then they can also asexually um, produce tiny little clones of themselves that just come out of the mouth. But they can also do sexual reproduction where they're releasing eggs and sperm or, or sometimes brooding. Uh, the fem a female will brood eggs and the sperm will get sort of drawn in through the mouth and they'll brood and then fertilize and grow these tiny baby anemones sexually within them. So they can do both sexual and asexual reproduction. Um, so yeah, quite amazing really. Okay, and then Morag has asked, um, are the marine nature reserves working around the coast? The well, most diverse our, our, network of, our network of marine conservation zones is, is great, and we're in a better position, really, for conservation than we were before we had them. But um, within each MCZ, these are the ones that are set up by the government, we've got a list of protected species and features. So um, if any of those protected features or species are under threat, then the powers that be can bring in protection. But what they aren't is they aren't no-take zones. And many marine scientists think that no-take zones where there's literally no human impact is a, a far better way of setting up marine protected areas. But it's not what we've got. And a lot of people, um, if you, you know, a lot of people are, are just assume that, that they're going to be no-take zones, but they're not. They're kind of protected areas where, where things are managed. And, and there are some areas that we've got that are going to really help, but there's also quite a few areas where they've almost been chosen because they're not really going to stop anyone doing anything. So how useful is that? Well, it is useful if a potential future threat came along, but at the moment, is it really of conservation value? And I'd probably have to say some of them no. Uh, we also have a lot of um, special areas of conservation in, that were set up through European law, and we're really hoping that we, they stay as strong after Brexit, because those have really helped. And certainly in places like the Fowl, special area of conservation, without that designation, we wouldn't have seen the banning of trawling and scholar dredging within the estuary that's really helped um, protected features like the mole beds and the seagrass beds. So those have been really useful, the special areas of conservation. We really don't want to see them weakened. But ideally, we'd like our government and future governments to be a lot more ambitious and to actually look at this idea of proper protected areas where literally nothing gets damaged. And um, from all around the world, we've seen that this is a really, really sensible, um, sensible way of protecting our, and, and, and increasing productivity for commercial fisheries, for example. 
um, it's a really sensible thing to have areas that are kind of reference areas where nothing um, is done to really impact species and wildlife. Um, and we have on the land, don't we? We have, we have national parks on land. And, um, but in the sea, we don't. We have, um, there's one area in the, in the southwest that's fully a no take zone, and that is Lund around Lundy Island. That's a tiny area. So we could do with a lot more. Cool. And then the final question comes from Susan, um, and it is Does anything eat the stalk jellyfish? Excellent question. They're not studied well enough for us to answer that i'm afraid i don't i don't know i mean they do have nematocysts so they are going to sting if something tries to eat them but there could be something that eats them and uh but at this stage I, i'm not exactly sure no um there are it's, it's quite amazing did you hear um heather talking about some of the sea slugs that eat anemones uh, so quite a few a few sea slugs, like the big sheep sea slugs they'll go around they'll eat snake locks and anemones and they'll package up all stinging cells in their guts which extend right down into those little wavy kind of um, processes, the little finger-like projections on their back and they actually use the stingers, the nematocysts, to defend themselves. So there are creatures that eat nadarians. Do any of them eat stalk jellies? Not sure, but maybe. Yeah. Please let us know if you've done a study. <laughs> yeah. um, and that seems to be all the questions um, so far. Um, so, yeah. yeah, someone's written there's a great stalk jelly resource. Yeah, I, I can't recommend oh, yeah. it enough. Um, staramodemeduse.co.uk. This is by Dave Fenwick. He knows a lot more about them than, than anyone else on this planet, I think. And he's a local uh, natural historian. And he has a lovely website called A Photo Marine. So, uh, very, very uh, um, well put together and inspiring website. And great resource for biologists like myself. I use it all the time. And there you go. Anyway, guys, thank you. I hope you found that interesting. I'm glad that lots of you have stayed till the end, so it couldn't have been that bad. Um, just a quick couple of words. It'll go up on Facebook later today, uh, YouTube, sorry, later today. And um, tomorrow we've got a fantastic presentation as well. And I'm not sure if there's any tickets left, but for those of you who've got... There was the last time I looked. It's going to be great. We're going to hear from uh, a really inspiring guy called um, Mickey Boss, who goes out snorkeling with his lovely underwater camera, just in very shallow water and studies the, the incredible diversity of seaweed we have around, um, around Cornwall. So tune in for that at two o'clock tomorrow. All right, thank you very much. Oh, don't forget to follow us on, on YouTube and uh, loads of great films going up there at the moment. We're trying to do our best during the, uh, the lockdown to keep you all uh, having fun and learning about marine biology. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. No worries.